Hi, this is Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Welcome to the weekly top three, the top three things on our mind here at Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets for the week of May 8th, 2023. The weekly top three is a regular segment on The Michael Duke Show. The show broadcasts on both Facebook Live and YouTube Live, as well as via streaming audio from the show's website, weekdays from 6 to 8 a.m. I join Michael weekly in the first hour of Tuesday's show from 6.25 to 7 a.m. for a discussion between the two of us about our three issues. We post the podcast of our discussion following the show on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets Facebook, YouTube, SoundCloud, Spotify, and Substack pages, also on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets website, as well as the projects page on national blog site medium.com. You can find past episodes of the weekly top three also at the same locations. Keep in mind that in addition to these podcasts, during the week, you also can follow and participate in the discussion with us of these and other issues affecting Alaska's fiscal and economic condition by following us on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and through our posts on Twitter. This week, our top three issues are these. First, we explain why, as we follow the news on Alaska fiscal policy, we are continually reminded of Samuel Beckett's play, Waiting for Godot. Second, we explain why, as we read the op-ed pages and even see Facebook ads, we are reminded of former U.S. Senator and Senate Finance Chairman Russell Long's summation of tax policy. Don't tax me, don't tax you, tax that guy behind the tree. And third, we discuss why pushing forward on a spending cap alone, rather than as a piece of an overall fiscal package, is a trap for the PFD. And now, let's join Michael. Brad Keithley joins us this morning to talk about the weekly top three. Uh, I have to say, you hurt my brain a little bit, Brad, when you <laughs> get the three weekly top three. Uh, the first of the weekly top three is the uh, we're basically we're living in the Alaskan uh, uh, edition of Waiting for Godot. And I'm like, OK, I feel dumb. What's waiting for Godot? And I spent 10 minutes down a rabbit hole in Wikipedia trying to figure out what that was about. Um, but uh, give us, uh, you know, tell us what you mean by that. Waiting for Godot is a famous play um, uh, where two guys stand on stage and wait for somebody for both acts and nothing ever happens. But it's an interesting uh Interesting topic. So, Brad, give us your thoughts on this. Well, it's a Samuel Beckett play. It's a it's it's a it's a widely produced, widely done play because it's fairly easy. There's like five characters in it, um, and the staging isn't isn't much. It's like a tree and a bench, um, and these two characters sit on the stage uh, in both acts. You're right, uh, waiting for Godot, and various people sort of traipse by, and they talk about various things, and various people traipse by that uh, that they engage. Um, and they just sit there for, <laughs> sit there and sit there and sit there. The first act, uh, the tree, uh, the tree, which is one of two props on the stage is bare. Uh, in the second act, the tree has, has leaves. It looks like it's bloomed and they're still waiting. Um, and the play ends with them still waiting, still waiting for Gitto. It's a, sometimes it's a boring place, depend upon, depends on how it's produced, but sometimes it's a boring play. And sometimes you really sort of try to delve in behind the various statements of the characters and try to figure out what the heck's going on, what Beckett had in his mind. And that, and that came to mind, <laughs> maybe for obvious reasons, it came to mind as, uh, as I was thinking about uh, the, the budget, talking about the budget and the fiscal plan uh, this week. You're, you're right. I, Cliff Groh's editorial is sort of the sort of top of mind when it, when it comes to this. Cliff goes off on a However many words, 650 word rant about is the is the House majority's fault. It's uh, yeah, he uh, starts right out with it, doesn't he? It's the House majority's fault that we haven't done anything. And I'm like, what? Wait, weren't you the guy that was supposed to grow the PFD? I haven't seen any big shakes out of you this year, buddy. Well, he's got he's got a bill in. What is it to increase the oil, the oil property tax, which wouldn't raise much. Um, but it's, but, you know, Cliff's got a bill in, he'll claim he has a bill in, but it's, it's, I mean, you, you, you go through the full rant and it, it's nothing. I mean, it's just, it's a rant about how everybody else hasn't done anything and how nothing's moving forward. But you read each of these, you read Larry Persley's column, uh, uh, latest op-ed, you read, you know, the, the stuff that's coming out of, 
uh, the the Alaska Beacon. You read the stuff that's coming out of the ADN, the article you read this morning. It's it's sort of like waiting for Godot, right? I mean, we ha you have these various characters coming through uh, the stage and you know giving saying various lines. We're sitting there waiting for the the fiscal plan or even the budget, even the FY24 budget uh, to come through. And it just doesn't come through. I mean, it just, it, we just keep sitting there and waiting for it. Ultimately, we, we will have a budget. Uh, ultimately, the state will not uh, uh, go FY, FY24 without a budget. So ultimately, we will have, have a budget. Godot, all, that Godot, sort of mini Godot will ultimately show up. But I'm not sure about the overall fiscal plan. I'm not sure that that we ever have an overall fiscal plan uh, show up. We just may stumble from year to year to year to year um, and never get and never get it done. We may go through various characters. We may go through various acts. We may go through various scenes. We may have various people, you know, come across the stage and say various lines, but we may ultimately, Godot may never come. Well, and, uh, it's just, this it, is it, something that Ben Carpenter said early on that it's going to take. I mean, it, that it, it may not get done this session, that it was going to be a heavy lift to try and get it all done. They're going through every bill this week to put them out on the House floor out of House uh, Ways and Means. Do you think that there's a chance of getting anything here in the last eight days to at least pass into the next part of the session? Or Oh, no. Oh, no. No. There, there's I, Out of Ways and Means, maybe, although I... I'll, Although I'll be honest, I don't understand the sales tax. I mean, the sales tax was heard a long time ago. What if we're going to do this piecemeal? And they did the—I the, I don't think they should have, but they did the the spending cap piecemeal. We'll talk about that in the third segment. Uh, if they're going to do this piecemeal, why not do you know other pieces of it piecemeal? Let it collect someplace. Let it collect someplace else. Um, I, I I I I maybe ways and means get something out. Uh, I have, I've despaired even of that. Um, but I, I, th this entire, this entire legislature, um, is just, you know, they're waiting for, you know, they're waiting for somebody else. Cliff's waiting for, you know, the house majority to do it or somebody else to do it. Everybody's waiting for somebody else to do it. Uh, Bert, says he'll do it <laughs> i mean i i guess i guess we do have uh, people who who will, yeah. who will put a pl plan on the floor but but uh it, it's just i as you as you sit there listening to the beckett players you sit there witnessing the beckett play you just sort of despair after a while and you just wonder why um and and that's exactly what's what's going on with the fiscal plan you, you wonder why they're waiting or you wonder why you bought tickets to this yeah, <laughs> you knew exactly what's going to happen i mean yeah maybe maybe the first time i wondered why they were waiting maybe the fifth time i saw the play produced uh maybe i wondered why i was buying tickets but it's it's it, it is a play that that talks about you know the inability or the or the, the despair that results from not being able to achieve something in part it talks about that and and that's that's really what's what's going on here, uh, you know. Let's let's go to the FY twenty four budget. There will be a budget. I mean, we will we will we will be financed. And and the way it's going, it looks like it's going to be a compromise. I, I know what Kevin McCabe has said that fifty fifty is already a compromise. I absolutely agree with that, but it looks like it will have to be some sort of compromise between twenty five seventy five. Uh, and uh, and POMV 5050, the bar got lowered down from the statutory formula down to POMV 5050, and now, you know, Bert's taking advantage of that and uh, and is and is pushing POMV 2575 with with equal vigor and and you know you've got to have a budget. So so where do you end up um, if the house if the house uh, capitulated uh, in terms of in terms of the Senate pushing through a budget that was 2575 and somehow Bryce got uh, the four votes, got, got a unified minority. I don't think he gets a unified minority, but for, for 2575, but somehow gets a, a unified minority and gets four votes from the majority to, to form the form a concurrence vote. Um, then the, then the attention shifts to the governor. Does the governor do something about that? Does the governor say, Oh no, we're going to go back to the drawing board or, or I'm not going to accept 2575. We're going to, you know, try again uh, uh, in this process. Um, but ultimately, we will have a budget. And ultimately, it looks like it'll be a compromise uh, between those between those two boundaries. But that's not a fiscal plan. That's just another punt uh, to get us through another fiscal year, and then we then we start talking about it 
and we start talking about it again. And maybe we have a special session, um, another another act in waiting for Godot in Alaska's version of waiting for Godot, uh, and and maybe something comes out of that. But there's there's everybody has gone to their trenches, right? I mean, everybody's just you know Bert sitting in twenty five in his twenty five seventy five trench. Um, you know, some are sitting in the statutory PFD trench. Some are sitting in POMB 5050 uh, in the POMB 5050 trench. Everybody's gone to their trenches and and there's no breakthrough uh, 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 thinking. I mean, the, the Senate, the Senate bill comes up with triggers, right? That that is POMB 2575 um, it, and you can get to POMB 5050 if you use triggers. OK, well, there's other ways to use triggers. Uh, let's say, you know, looking backwards, let's say we should have said we're going to cut spending unless you raise revenues uh, uh, equitably across the board from all Alaskans. And then the pressure would have been on uh, uh, do you want do you want to have a tax or do you want to increase increase spending? Um, you can use triggers in a number of ways, and maybe there's a creative way to use triggers uh, now that the Senate has introduced triggers. Uh, the 2575 to POMB 5050 trigger. Maybe there's a creative way to use triggers uh, to sort of to sort of work our way out of this. That is, if you don't, if we don't increase revenues um, uh, to offset PFD cuts, if we don't increase revenues, then spending gets cut, or spending gets capped, or spending gets something happens to spending. Maybe that's another way to to think about this. But we've we've sort of locked in. I mean, like Godot, we like the play. We've sort of just locked in on this on this continual repetitious um, uh, cycle of we're going to have a fiscal plan. My gosh, here, you know, we need to have a fiscal plan or, you know, Cliff's uh, uh, what's the title of Cliff's of peace. Enough uh, talk of a fiscal plan. Alaska needs action. I mean, okay. Yeah. Everybody can rant about it, but, but nobody is coming up with a solution that, that, that gets a, a broad based, uh, broad based appeal enough of an appeal to get through the two legislative bodies. Well, and again, this is really nothing new. This is the SSDD, right? Same stuff, different day that we've seen each and every year uh, from uh, from the legis uh, from the legislature. Um, and you say we're going to have a budget, but it's going to be interesting to see how strong the my the uh, majority in the House stands on this. Do they push it to the very end? Do you think? Does it does it end up in a? Do we end up in a, a in a uh, potential? you know, shut down or whatever else that is going on. I mean, the House has put their budget out. The Senate has refused to do so. I'm wondering how the House minority and the Senate majority are going to spin this together to say it's their fault, because that's what always happens, right? Um, you know, it's their fault that they're going to, uh, to, to not have a budget and the shutdown would be their fault, even though they've already put out the budget, you know, a couple, several weeks ago, and they're just waiting for the Senate to do it. I mean... And 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 does something come out in the last minute here from House uh, from uh, Ways and Means that is another part, or should they have done should they have done this as an omnibus? I guess is my question, because we've seen all these little parts and pieces that have come through Ways and Means. Were you saying that basically they should have done it as an omnibus to make uh, to you know to to avoid the piecemeal effect of it? Oh yeah, yeah, they should. I mean, I, I'll talk more about this in the third segment about the about the why the spending cap is a trap for the PFD. We've talked about it before on the show, but I'm going to go back to that. Um, and that should have been a part of the solution. It should have been part of an omnibus. If they were going to push it forward uh, as an omnibus, then it should have been, it, and, and they should. I mean, that's what the fiscal policy working group said. It needed to be all done, done at once. It should have been pushed forward as an omnibus and, it, and you know, all the pieces should have been there. I don't, I don't, I don't get why, uh, you know, a part of waiting for Godot is we're still waiting for the governor's sales tax. I don't get why the revenue piece of this has stalled. Uh, the governor hasn't. The governor said two weeks ago he was going to come out with the sales tax. It would be finished on the on the Friday, Thursday or Friday of that week. You know, it doesn't take that much to write a bill, in all honesty. Um, and, and that should have been done uh, uh, before the governor even started talking about it. But he said it was going to be finished on Thursday and Friday. Well, that's now 10 days ago. Um, and, and Ben had the, had, Ben has a bill in front of ways and means on sales taxes, and that has been heard, but it's still pending, still pending action. Um, and so I don't understand why that, that, 
that piece of it is still uh, is still spending. It's a, I mean, the fiscal policy working group said there had to be substitute revenues for PF. If we were gonna, if we were gonna restore the PFD, if we were not gonna have deep PFD cuts, then we needed substitute revenues uh, to pay for government. It was realistic about that, and I don't know, I, I don't understand why that piece has stalled. So, you know, there's a lot of there's a lot of moving parts in here. Uh, just like there's a lot of moving parts in the play, uh, a lot of characters that come across the stage, but but none of it settles down to uh, none of it settles down to a solution. Is is are we going to have a shutdown? Maybe, May, maybe as part of the negotiating tactic, we'll get we'll get close to that. I mean, the House seems the House majority seems fairly well resolved to to hang on, but you know we got close to a shutdown before and it didn't happen. Somebody gave and some side gave and, and we finally got, and we got a budget and went forward with, the with, the with the year. I'm, I'm confident that, that we will have a budget for FY24. We won't start FY24 without a budget. So something's got to give. Um, I'm not sure that we're going to, uh, I'm not sure where the give's going to be, uh, other than the PFD, which is where, you know, the, the contention point is. So Donna Ardwin in the chat room points out one uh, one omnibus bill is not legally feasible because we have a single subject requirement in the state. Um, pass pass them all at the same time. Yeah, that's that's, that's not a. I mean, that's well, I mean, not that, that's I, not a, a a limitation. I'm wondering if uh, if you could legally argue that uh, fiscal policy is a single subject with with many components, but. Um, I mean, this is this is a tough deal. And, you know, look, uh, uh, Brad, uh, excuse me, uh, Ben Carpenter said early on, he said this is not going to be a, a, the, pro- the effort of one single year. But we definitely need to get some things through first. And the first thing we should have gotten through was the PFD and then the then the spending cap. Uh, <laughs> See, that's the problem. That's, that's go ahead. That, that's what the fiscal policy working group felt, I think recognized and maybe the lesson we've lost again is that everybody wants their thing first. Uh, you, you know, I pass the PFD, protect the PFD. Then we'll talk about, then we'll talk about other things. Well, once you protect the F, the PFD, then, then the, the people who want, you know, continued spending and there are people who want continued spending. Let's be, let's be, let's face up to the reality of the world. Uh, they're they're going to feel like you know they're 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 they've been put under the rock. So you go through these things, you know. Let's pass a let's pass a tax first, let, and, and then your point is well, you know, heck, that just fuels increased spending. So that doesn't do any good. Uh, let's pass uh, let's pass spending cuts first. Well, the people who the, the piece that that we're going to do through spending cuts. Well, the people who are affected by that are are upset by that. I mean, it's just. Everybody, everybody has their favorite. Yes, you're right. I mean, I have the PFD. We share, you know, the fact that we want the PFD first. I, it's got to move. It's got to move all together, or it's or it's not going to move. There are enough constituent groups. There are enough. This thing's fractionated enough that I think the fiscal policy working group recognized it all has to go at the same time. And and it's sort of like you know. <laughs> Either you do that or nothing shows. Either either you do that or you just don't have a you don't have a plan. You know, you're trying to you're, you're having somebody who's trying to you know uh, 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 bench press or you know submit uh, uh, another guy. I mean that's what Bert's doing with twenty five seventy five, right? Bert's trying to you know force it down. Oh force yeah, it down everybody's throat. Well, he's he's uh, very he's very good at the coercion. He's been coercive for the last four or five years, uh, as, uh, you know, in the, in a Senate finance like that, doing the things, whether it was changing the funding source of the, of the deal or making sure that you voted for his plan or you lost road project monies or whatever else, he's very good at the political strong arm tactics. And that's, you know, that's, that's the problem. Um, and, and I agree. I mean, I, I don't know, maybe, uh, again, I'm not in the legislature, so but I, I, to me, the fiscal policy would be a good single source. I mean that that would be a one one rule. I mean that'd be the one one single requirement rule. It's got pieces and parts. We've done the same thing. If you're changing a bill on crime, it's got lots of moving parts inside of it, and it's still a single bill, changing multiple parts of the law to make it work. So I don't know why, arguably, you couldn't do that as this is a full fiscal policy bill and we're changing all these pieces and parts because it's, it's a fiscal plan. 
or you can or you can put in a condition. I mean, we 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 we've, we've now learned we can put in conditions in legislation, right? Legislation X won't take effect unless legislation Y takes effect. So you just put in you cross conditions across all of the various pieces of it. That's not that to me is not is not you know that's a technicality. That's not a that's not a reason to you know to not try to advance them all at once. I it's it it strikes me that you know this is. I mean, waiting for Godot is you, you just keep going in circles. You just keep waiting for Godot. Some of the same characters come back over and over and over. The seasons change. The leaves are on the trees in the second act. But it just keeps going in circles. And this is, to some degree, this is sort of the circle we're in. I mean, the Fiscal Policy Working Group was a great capture of, of what it takes to bring everybody together. Those people in, in that process, I think, tried to really come together together. Uh, on a, on a solution and articulated what it took to, to, to take a solution that we didn't do that. Nobody introduced legislation to do that. And so now we're on the circle again, and maybe we're out at the other end of it where, you know, everybody says, well, let me, let me pass this piece. And then the other piece will catch up and all that sort of stuff. I, 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 I think we're, you know, we're going to circle back and we're going to say, well, hey, wait, we got to do all this stuff at, at once. Um, but nobody, but, <coughs> But, you know, everybody wants to rant about it. I want to rant about it. You rant about it. Cliff rants, Cliff Grove rants about it. Everybody wants to rant about it, but nobody really is, is, is bringing this stuff together in a way that, that comes up with a, with an ultimate solution. And so we just sit here and wait. Waiting, waiting for the, <clears throat> waiting for the leaves to pop out on the trees and to sit here some more. That's, uh, that's what it's all about. Give me the tease for number two uh, of the weekly top three before we go to break. So Russell Long, who was a longtime senator from Louisiana and chairman of the Senate Finance Committee, U.S. Senate Finance Committee at a point, uh, at, at some point during uh, during his tenure as Senate Finance Chair, someone asked him to sum up uh, tax policy uh, in the U.S. And Long had this great quote. Uh, basically, the quote is, don't tax me, don't tax you, tax that guy behind the tree. Right. And and we're seeing, we're seeing all these editorials now pop up or articles or or pieces pop up now, or an ad in one case, pop up uh, uh, with various people saying, "Don't tax me, <laughs> don't tax, don't tax right. my my friends, tax the guy behind the tree." And the guy behind the tree is always middle and lower income Alaska families through PFD cuts. So, right, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, about how who, that's developing in the state. Who happen to have the quietest voices? Who happen to have the littlest influence or the littlest input on most of these things? That's the thing. Don't tax you, don't tax me, tax the man behind the tree. That's what it's all about. Brad Keithley is our guest, and we're talking about the weekly top three. We're up to number two. Don't tax you, don't tax me, tax the man behind the tree. Uh, Brad says we've been playing that game for a while, speaking of waiting for Godot. Uh, Brad, <laughs> uh, this is the 2023 edition of that little uh, meme. So what, what, uh, what say you? Oh, I, Michael, as I as I have been reading through, just following along what's going on, it started to started to strike me that you know the the old Russell uh, 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 Long adage about "Don't tax me, don't tax you, tax the guy behind the tree" uh, started popping back up. Uh, there was a an op ed in the Peninsula Clarion that says uh, it's in the Alaska Voices. Uh, Senate tax bills threaten critically needed community investment, and they're talking about the Hillcorp loophole of all things. God, it's a, it's opposing the the Hillcorp loopholes by Rob Erbach, who who is the head of the uh, Iditarod. Uh, Hillcorp uh, uh, funded a bunch of the Iditarod uh, this past year, and so Erbach's talking about, oh, it's ho it'd be horrible to tax Hillcorp. You know, they might they might not support uh, Alaska. Uh, activities if uh, if you if you close that loophole and, and took away their you know hundred million dollars uh, in uh, tax benefits that they're getting from uh, from the state and then there was a an opinion piece uh, from our favorites uh, 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 Jim Jansen uh, and friends that says Alaska has a bright future if we keep oil taxes competitive opposing the the change to the uh, to the to the uh, 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 adjuster that's in the the per rail credit that's in the current tax code and then sort of the the topper for me was his facebook ads by alaskans for americans for prosperity alaska um 
Let your elected officials know, no to a statewide sales tax, no to a statewide income tax, yes to a spending cap. <coughs> yes to the thing that, that benefits them. I'll explain it in the third segment, but yes to the thing that benefits them. Uh, uh, no to everything, no to everything else. And it's just, in all of these, all of these result in one thing, the, 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 the Hill Corp op-ed, uh, the, 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 the argument against uh, uh, changing the per rail credits, the no to the statewide sales tax, no to the statewide income tax. Um, they all result in one thing, one thing. The PFD takes it on the chin, right? Don't tax me. Don't tax, you know, businesses. Don't tax the oil companies. Don't tax, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the people who depend on the oil companies, the businesses, the oil companies support. Uh, don't tax uh, 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 high, high income Alaskans. Don't have a statewide sales tax. Uh, don't tax me. Don't tax you. Don't tax my friends in the oil industry. Tax the guy behind the tree. And who's the guy behind the tree is, is the is middle and lower income Alaska families are middle and lower income Alaska families by taxing them through PFD cuts. Why, why what uh, ICER's Matt Berman has said one more time has said uh, the most regressive tax ever. Uh, uh, use that uh, instead. They don't say use that instead, but they're trying to foreclose all of the other options and say, you know, this is this is where we need to this is where we need to land. So. We, we've got we got waiting for Godot, you know, and while we're waiting for Godot, well, well, various characters are walking through various proposals on how to various individual proposals are talk, are walking through uh, the stage. We've got uh, Russell Long showing up and, and, you know, Senate, the old U.S. Senate Finance Committee, people saying, don't tax me, don't tax, don't tax you, don't tax me, tax that guy behind the tree. And uh right. And we're well, just full of it. We're just full of it right now. Every editorial, every op-ed. I mean, Cliff's got it. Cliff's op-ed has has a version of that. Every 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 person out there is has got a plan that doesn't tax them. Taxes everybody else. Right. Takes money from everybody else, but doesn't tax them. Well, and that's exactly it. I mean, Brad's just talking about. I mean, oil taxes that the people are standing against. That Brad says that that we have needed. You know, and and as I said in the last segment. The ones that have the the quietest voice, the least amount of influence, are those lower, you know, those middle to lower income folks, because they don't, they don't, especially the middle income folks, they don't have any skin in the game. They're not receiving state services on one hand, and they're not receiving state contracts on the other hand. So they're the ones that are getting, uh, they're the ones that are getting squeezed in the middle, and that's where it all comes from. Um, I mean, we need a full fiscal plan, and the fiscal plan includes oil taxes and changes. I mean, uh, you, 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 I'm sure have been lambasted uh, by many in the oil industry for supporting the Hill Corps, uh, uh, you know, change and talking about the per barrel credit change and supporting those kind of things. I'm sure you've taken it on the chin on those guys as well. But I mean, that's the thing. I think when you're doing the right thing, everyone hates you, Brad. That's kind of what, that's kind of the conclusion that I've come to in the last you know, few years. You know, the funny thing about my friends in the industry, yes, they do. They do take issue with me on the, on the per barrel credits. They, they will try to defend the per barrel credits. I've not had anybody from the oil industry try to defend the Hillcorp loophole. The, the closest I've had is somebody said, well, you know, that was the tax code at the time Hillcorp made the acquisition. And so Hillcorp ought to be re- able to rely on the tax on the tax code that was in effect at the time of the acquisition they you know they that was the deal uh that that hill corp relied on when they came into alaska oh baloney i mean if you're in the oil industry you know one thing you know laws change you know regulations change you know taxes change you know you know change is inevitable when you do a deal you do a list you do two lists lists of things that are absolutely deal breakers that you've got to have in order to make the deal and, and a list of things that would be, what would be great. You know, it'd be a windfall if I, if I got these, if I got these additional things and believe me, the preservation of the Hill Corp loophole, the preservation of, of the exemption for S corps on the, in the oil industry from the oil industry, corporate uh, income tax, believe me, that was on Hill Corp's wish list. Oh my, oh my God, we get a hundred million dollars extra because we were able to, you know, convince people to keep this going. I've not had anybody in the oil industry, to be very honest, I talk to them all the time. A lot of friends still in the industry. <clears throat> They'll debate me all day long on the, on the, on the per barrel credits. Uh, that's, that's a debate to have. 
But nobody, nobody's debated, debated me on the Hillcorp exemption. And yet we still have that damn exemption, that damn loophole uh, on the book. So it's, uh, you know, it, it's just, it's, it's, a, it's a, 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 a classic case of don't tax me, don't tax you. You know, th this, this op-ed by the guy from Iditarod is just infuriating uh, because it's, look, Iditarod is getting benefits out of this exemption. Hillcorp likes this. Hillcorp, well, why do you think Hillcorp's spending that money? So you'll write op-eds like that. So you'll write op-eds defending it. Yeah. <coughs> Guess who's really paying for the Iditarod? It's middle and lower income Alaska families through PFD cuts. Why is that? Because the only reason Hillcorp's paying you is because they get that extra hundred million. Why do they get the extra hundred million? Because we're taking it out of PFDs uh, instead. So instead of writing a thank you to middle and lower income Alaska families who are funding, essentially funding uh, through, you know, the, the, the absence of closing the Hillcorp loophole or funding the Iditarod, instead of getting a thank you to middle and lower income Alaska families, we get this damn defense letter uh, of the Hillcorp loophole. It's um, well, the subheading of it is uh, Hillcorp Alaska's role as a major <laughs> sponsor of our race is a source of great pride. I'm sure it is a source of great pride to get, you know, a million dollars from Hill Corp or whatever it is that you're getting for the race. I'm sure that is great pride, but again, who's paying for it in the long run? I, you, you, the, the rate of return on that, you know, give me a, a million dollars to Iditarod, you get a letter in defense of a hundred million dollars. I mean, that's the, that's a pretty good rate of return on that investment by Hill Corp. Yeah. Not a bad, not a bad rate, uh, a return, uh, less than two minutes, Brad, do we have time for number three? Can you give me a tease at least? Yeah, no, I can give you uh, uh, number three is very simple. Uh, and we've talked about this before. The, the spending cap contemplates at a lesser rate, but contemplates spending going up it, to, to a lesser rate, but still contemplates spending going up. Revenues from traditional sources, from oil and, and traditional taxes are going down. That gap, even with the spending cap, that gap has to be filled by something. If we don't have a comprehensive solution, that has substitute revenues for PFD cuts, that gap gets filled increasingly by PFD cuts as, as, as spending continues going up at a lesser rate, but as spending continues going up and revenues continue to decline, that gap gets filled by growing PFD cuts. You need a comprehensive solution that addresses the PFD issue. If you don't have it, a spending cap alone just leaves the PFD out there to be picked off uh, on an ongoing basis year after year after year. Yeah, uh, I can see it. Uh, again, that's why I said earlier on, I said if we had to prioritize, I thought the PFD had to go first and then the spending cap, not the other way around. Otherwise, we're going to be in big trouble. But again, how do we get them all together, especially with the one subject rule and all that other kind of stuff? Don't it, don't don't let that don't let that trouble you. There are ways to deal with that. All right. Well, I'd like to know more about that. I mean, that's really the problem. We see these things coming out piecemeal and all. And this was what I was seeing and I was thinking about as, uh, you know, House Ways and Means has pulled all these different pieces together. Um, I mean, I admired the tenacity of a carpenter and company for doing all this, but I realized that all it would take is for one bill, uh, the group to come, you know, the anti group to come together at one point and kill one component of this to really be able to submarine a big chunk of the whole fiscal plan, because that's all they need to do. They could let everything else pass and have that one bill and just riddle it full of holes. And the next thing you know, we're kind of stuck back where we started. Well, and the other, the other way to do it, Michael is, is what's happening is what's happened with letting the, letting the spending cap out. The other way to kill it, kill a comprehensive solution is to let one piece go first. And the I, I know the chambers in favor of the spending cap, and I can explain why the top twenty percent love that. Um, uh, but you know, let one piece go first and get out there, and then everybody says, "Well, we've we got a fiscal plan. You know, we we've we've accomplished this. We we've, we've achieved uh, uh, we've achieved a, a fiscal plan. We've got you know, Bert will say I've got twenty five seventy five, and then you got a spending cap that caps spending. We're done." You know, yeah, you you guys can continue talking about, you know, changes to the PFD. You guys can continue to talk about substitute revenues for PFDs, but we're done. You know, we got we got we got the one piece we wanted. The reason the chamber wants a spending cap is because they're concerned the government will continue to grow. And even after you consume all of the PFD, 
um, which they don't care about. But even after you consume all of the PFD, then there will be a push for taxes. And they want a spending cap to prevent against that situation, against against spending so and go, going so high that even after you consume the entire PFD, that you'll need that you'll need additional revenues. So the spending cap is is basically to keep the the spending levels within the within the range of consuming the entire PFD, but still um, uh, and, and 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 but not need, not needing additional revenues. That's why they want a spending cap and letting that go first. Uh, I think it's just a I, I, I think it's just a mistake. Because you're going to get out there and if that passed and if the Senate would adopt it, heck, they'd love it. That because it's chamber supported. That if that gets out there and 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 passes, um, the, the the don't tax me, don't tax you crowd are are ecstatic. They've got they've got protection against the downside of of needing additional revenues beyond the PFD, and they've got the PFD trapped in there in a way that it's going to be it's it's going to be the filler. Or whatever whatever the shortfall is between the spending cap and and traditional revenues, horrible horrible to let that thing out by itself. But nonetheless, that's what we've done. And so there's two ways to kill it. One is to one is to pick off your least favorite uh, uh, part of it and say, yeah, we can pass the rest of this except for that. Or the other way to kill it is to let one piece of it out, one piece that you know the top twenty percent like uh, out. And pass that, and then you know, just forget about everything else. Just keep everything else bottled up. Well, <clears throat> and again, with your you know talking about your incline and your decline thing, the problem is is that it's going to, by its very nature, grow beyond what the PFD has available. So it's almost inevitable that there's going to be a tax of some kind down the road, right? Well, I mean, it, it not not if you not if you tighten the spending cap in a way so that it never grows out outgrows the PFD. And I've, I've done like a 10 year projection. I haven't gone out, you know, 25 years, but I've done a 10 year projection and the way the spending cap is designed, the way tying it to uh, uh, uh gross state product, the way the spending cap is designed, it probably doesn't outstrip the PFD within, within the 10 year period. Now the PFD can't stay at 25, 75. You're going to have to, you're after going to go inside uh, the 25% to, uh, uh, to, to fund it. But that's not a problem because 2575 is only a statute. So you just ignore the statute again. We we did that last week on the show. You know, 2575 becomes 2080, becomes 1585, becomes 1090. And then, you know, <coughs> it's but the but but the chamber won't help you at that point. Nobody cares uh, for middle and lower income Alaska families at that point because they got what they want. They've got a, they've got the upside cap. Uh, of the spending cap, it's just the PFD that gets trapped in there and gets uh, and gets used. So that's why you need a comprehensive solution. That's why you need everything at once. That's why you need the cross ties. Everything conditioned on everything else uh, moving forward. And the fact the House has moved forward, the House Ways and Means move forward on the spending cap, and now it looks like House Finance is prepared to move forward on the spending cap, and then that will become the negotiating tool against the against the Senate. Yes, we'll accept twenty five seventy five if you accept the the spending cap. Uh, the Senate's going to go, you know, yeah, what a deal. Uh, the fact we're on that track, I think, is just you know, I, I think it's just horrible, and I and I and, and it's problematic that Ways and Means let the spending cap out on its own. Well, I, I'm interested to see, you know, you said, because when I said it, it, we wanted it should have come out all together instead of piecemeal. And you said that that is fixable. I would like to know exactly how. Uh, I think it was Tom McKay that said something about Ledge Legal uh, had already, I don't know, ruled on the single subject rule or something like that. But I mean, you cross tied the bills. I mean, if you if you you pass this, it, even if you pass this, it doesn't take effect unless you pass that. And, and, you know, and, and there's, there's risk to that. I mean, I guess an amendment on the floor could take out that cross tie, but, but at least have them all up at once, at least give them a fighting, a fighting chance. The fact you've let one out, the fact you've let the, the spending cap out, the, the chamber of commerce preferred spending cap out first um, is, you know, we've, we've already started going down the bad road. You've already, you've already done damage to the concept of everything tied together. 
Brad, thank you so much for coming on board. I appreciate you being part of it today. Uh, as always, a thought-provoking conversation, and we appreciate you uh, doing it with us. Michael, as always, thanks for having me. Well, that's a wrap for another week's edition of the weekly top three from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you again for joining us. Remember that you can find past episodes on our YouTube, SoundCloud, Spotify, and Substack pages, and keep track of us during the week on Facebook and Twitter. This has been Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We look forward to you joining us again next week on the weekly top three.